So we know the purpose of an LVAD is simple. It's to minimize congestive heart failure as a syndrome. So the pump unloads the left ventricle and improves output and thereby, for many patients, improves end organ function but curbs heart failure. And what's unique about these, um, these pumps that are continuous flow pumps is that you can set the particular speed and, and uh, dial in how fast that rotor spins. And so certainly every pump is subject to the environment which it's working, namely preload, afterload, also influenced in terms of flow through the pump by native contractility. But how robust that pump is working or not is dialed in by us. And so this is the workhorse, HeartMate 2. It's um, sub-diaphragmatic, so the pump itself is below the diaphragm, pre-pertonil. -pre Inflow canyon in the left atrium, blood comes propelled from the LV through the pump. These continuous flow pumps, it's quite easy. There's two versions um, of continuous flow. Axial, where blood comes in to the rotor parallel to the rotor and out parallel. That's axial flow physiology. There's an outflow cannula here and blood's pumped into the ascending aorta. In contrast, let me make sure I can click. Good. In contrast, centrifugal pumps, the HVAD and the HeartMate 3 are examples of this. Blood comes in and uh, at, a, at a right angle to the, to the rotor and leaves at a right axis. So, so, so if I told you the tandem heart, you guys have visualized the tandem heart, is the tandem heart axial flow pump or centrifugal pump? Centrifugal, good. What about the impella, 2.5? Axial flow or centrifugal? Axial, microaxial physiology, right? It's coming parallel and leaving from LV. So whether it's the CP or Pella 50, those are axial flow, microaxial flow pumps compared to centrifugal pumps. Um, and we won't get into the nuance of, of the degree of unloading related to these pumps. They do have different uh, pressure volume relationships in terms of um, 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 head pressure, if you will. But the, the HVAD is not subdiaphragmatic. It's at the pericardium. Because the moving rotor is so close to the LV, this does create some color artifact and degradation. You see that for the microaxial flow, right? If you're imaging in a, in a color sector near, near, near the rotor, you'll see this color artifact. And so the HeartMate 3, which I think will become the workhorse moving forward, is a uh, pericardial pump centrifugal, um, unique in that it is based on mag levitation. So let's jump into echo. And let's keep it simple. There are four types of studies. And it's either a routine surveillance study, and there is some heterogeneity across the 150 plus implanting bad centers about what qualifies as surveillance. For example, maybe two weeks post-op, then every month thereafter for the six months, then maybe every three months. Um, but we're gonna talk about what a surveillance study should look like from acquisition to interpretation. Um, a, a ramp study for pump speed optimization is the second type. Ruling out pump malfunction in the setting of suspected rotor thrombus is a third. And then we have recovery protocols, which are the least commonly used. And so from an acquisition standpoint, the techs know this well, it's do exactly that what you would do in terms of 2D spectral Doppler and imaging for any heart failure patient. These are the special considerations. We want to understand aortic valve function. So typically, we like three to five cardiac cycles. We also want to understand inflow and outflow cannula um, um, anatomy. And so some special considerations related to optimizing inflow cannula or outflow cannula visualization. That's pretty much it. But we also want to know what pump we're looking at and what the pump speed is. So these things should be annotated on the echo report. Um, and so this is an example of an appropriate um, HeartMate 2, pump speed lower level. Oh, I'm not going to get into the details of the standard echo read, but linear dimensions are, are key. And this is on low levels of support. The heart is big. You just dial it up, and instantaneously, you see significant reduction in LV size. And so that, it's actually a good marker for the degree of unloading. And we've been uh, doing some work to understand delta LV and diastolic uh, dimensions in terms of how it correlates to how it correlates to wedge. So the aortic valve 
can be seen by 2D or um, M mode. And it's, it's very easy to appreciate. While there is, compared to a normal patient with normal ventricular function, a reduction in how long the aortic valve remains open, right? Typically in excess of maybe 250 milliseconds. Here, open with every beat after ventricular systole. This particular patient persistently closed, right? And that's intermittent here, closed here. So when you're filling for a pulse, the clinical correlate to this is when you're filling for a pulse, you want to fill for some time, 5 to 15 seconds. Um, if you have a pulse, you have a pulse pressure, and the cuff can be used to understand blood pressure. If you have no pulse, as exemplified by here, or very partial pulse, then we're really relying on Doppler to understand that the opening pressure in someone without a pulse is the, it, it, it is the systolic, but it's so close to the mean because the systolic and diastolic are so close together, we call it the mean. So that, that's an important takeaway. So let's jump into some differences um, in terms of the, the acquisition and report. Inflow cannula assessment. Now, Dr. Suming Chang will give you what we would qualify as is the gold standard related to CT. You're talking about CT and UCLE or just CT? CT, perfect. But you can get a hint. We're defining this. We're, no one has a working definition to say, okay, this is inflow cannula malposition, greater than 30 degrees angle off axis if you draw the reference line to the anterior leaflet. No one has such a definition. We're trying to let the data define the definition in terms of association with adverse outcome. But in general, the inflow cannula should be directed um, towards the left ventricular outflow tract mitral valve apparatus. You want that barrel within the middle of the LV, right? Free from irritation of the, free from irritating the endocardium in terms of potential for suction events. So color flow can help you isolate it. Short axis can help you see it. And then here it can be a little bit harder to appreciate what's uh, artifact or not, or mirror artifact. Um, but echo is, is first line. But we wanna know what these velocities are. You know, this is a continuous flow pump, but what we appreciate is that with ventricular systole, there's contribution made by the LV into the pump. The continuous flow is this background diastolic flow. You appreciate that, right? And so, so here the diastolic flows here. This is the peak flow influenced by the contribution of the LV. So in those patients that have acquired aortic root clot or left main clot, and the LV is not contracting, and they're 100% LVAD dependent, you lose the pulsatility is it because of a lack of contribution from, from the LV. Much like is true for screening for aortic stenosis in terms of the Reynolds number, you guys know what the Reynolds number is? Right, more than two meters per second, obstructive sign. Um, these velocities are significantly under 1.5 uh, meters uh, per second. And so we, we like to understand this coming off pump in, in the OR, and this is TEE, you really wanna open up the apex 3D can also be, be used. And so you want to understand that relationship to the, either the anteroseptum, a septum, or the anterolateral wall. Yeah. So that's the peak. So what we, what, what we really want both. We want the peak systolic. We want the peak velocity and the nadir velocity, the systolic and diastolic. We call it systolic and diastolic. Yeah. But we want all this to be underneath. 1.5, or if you look at a cohort of 100 patients by the HeartMate 2, and these different pumps have different ranges, to be honest with you, but they shouldn't, you should not see obstructive flow. So yeah, no, thank you for that question. And then the outflow cannula can be imaged by the, by, uh, the trans thoracic echo. Um, and there are some instances where we're worried about kinking and the lack of a Doppler signal or, or obstruction, and you can see a change, but these outflow cannula velocities mirror what we see with, from the inflow cannula velocities. And so you don't need TEE. You can certainly appreciate it by TEE. So the text should be imaging all patients along the right uh, peristernal border to understand outflow cannula velocities. Now for most patients in an asymptomatic stable LVAD patient, it's not as needed. But when you have uh, alarm troubleshooting, like a low flow alarm, and you go through your clinical di differential low flow alarm, knowing that outflow cannula kinking can be one, it could be helpful. Um, and in addition to, to CT. So let's go through some examples of inflow cannulas that are not in the typical normal position. So here by the peris modified peristernal, um, very close to the, to the septum. 
when you look at the short axis, remember anterior, posterior, instead of being right in the middle, this is very anterior. And look at the velocity, uh, velocity signals that we're getting. Again, less than, more than that 1.5. Now this may be workable for an individual patient, but they're gonna be very preload dependent. They may have frequent low flow alarms. So in contrast, this inflow cannula is very posterior. And when you look at this as exemplified by the short axis, by the short axis and you look at the apical four, you, you see the uh, metallic artifact mid-ventricle. So this is overtly malpositioned. In fact, you got tethering of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. So we're gonna want a hint of inflow cannula positioning by echo. So you were asking me, and, and this is evolving. I showed this last year, but if you were to ask me the most, uh, the earliest sign of compromised pump function, you get uh, a decrease in that background diastolic flow. So when you compare the ratio of systolic to diastolic in the setting of hemolysis, <coughs> as did the Mayo group, um, there was a rise in the ratio. When they treated it or augmented therapy, there was a subsequent decline in the ratio, which would be the earliest sign. Can you get increased velocity just from pump malposition, or does that have to be some element of pump thrombosis? So pump, pump, where we see pump thrombosis typically is in the rotor. That should not give you a, um, an increase in either your, uh, in, in your peak systolic. Now, what it will do is it'll give you a decrease in your diastolic peak. But these are such low flow velocities, you may not appreciate it um, by echo. We look at other echocardiographic signs that the pump's not working in the setting of rhodothrombus, and that's um, changes in LV size, and I'm gonna get to our rule out pump malfunction protocol. And so I think that's an important to keep, keep in mind. So let's, um, let's go through the early postoperative phase in terms of the role of imaging and how we're using this. And early postoperatively, it's all about the RV, but we see elevated CVP and or hypotension for a variety of reasons. And so when I see a patient who's becoming hypotensive, high CVP, I'm worried about RV failure and tamponade. That's, a po that's in contrast to partial LV unloading in terms of someone with smoldering heart failure. They shouldn't really be hypotensive. And so this is the most overt example you'll see of what I would qualify as clinically meaningful RV failure. And so this is post-op day one. This is the LV, this is the RV. So a couple of observations. The LV is very, very, very small, underfilled. Um, the RV is very, very dilated and depressed. Now I can tell you, we looked at on the front end of echo surrogates of RV function or dysfunction in terms of predicting the need for unplanned RVAD, which is the hardest outcome for, for LVAD in terms of RV failure. And the majority of our patients go into this procedure with depressed RV function and a dilated RV. But when you're seeing you know, the interatrial septum bowing over into the LA because of a high right atrial pressure, very dilated <coughs> RV, um, LV that's underfilled, this, this, is, this is overt. And so in this particular patient, we had to open up the chest, implement nitric oxide, we had strong consideration for using an RVAD, but by aggressive medical interventions, we were able to make this configuration into a uh, workable scenario for this patient who ended up living an additional two years. But you can appreciate his RV is not perfect, right? By no means, even on, on the back end. But we like to understand uh, the interventricular septal position and interatrial septum position to understand the pressure differential between RV and LV. Um, in terms of the optimal pump speed setting. And so this pump speed setting for this HeartMate 2 patient, perhaps relatively lower, but we're, our goal is to unload the LV, but not overload the LV, where we're compromising function of, 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 of the RV, perhaps with higher grade TR. Now, this is someone in the ICU with low blood pressure, high CVP. So you want to make sure it's not significant RV failure. And tamponade can be a little bit more challenging because these patients are on a continuous slow LVAD. But when we see pericardial effusion, certainly in the presence of chamber collapse, um, we, we drain it. If we see significant pericardial effusion with hypotension and we don't think it's RV failure, we drain it. We take it out of the equation. So if you see someone, um, so echo can be very useful. To, now you have a swan gans and you have hemodynamics. Remember, blood pressure, high CVP, the alarm, uh, con the console can, can help you in setting, of, in setting of alarm troubleshooting, but both scenarios would have low flow alarms. So the echo can really tease you out, te tease out best next step in terms of the surgeon opening up the chest, 
with anticipating draining the effusion or opening the chest to help uh, minimize RV failure. Now, the patients, you know, transition to, to the floor. In RV failure, there is a spectrum. We have patients that, that we were able to get out of the unit but still have a relatively underfilled LV, interatrial septum bowing into the left atrium, significant TR, and this is, you know, a patient two weeks out with smoldering RV failure where we're using prolonged ondotropes. And so the echo correlate to the clinical observations would be key. In this scenario, we want to wean the ondotropes and see how he does clinically with kidney function, blood pressure. We may repeat an echo just to understand optimization of speed, which I'll, which I'll get to. Now, this uh, particular patient was more than several months out, and this concept of late RV failure on an LVAD, we're learning more about in terms of prevalence and, and predictors. But you can certainly appreciate the interventricular septal motion, and it's really with LV contraction where LV, where LV pressure is highest to then get the septum over to the RV, bowing of the left, of the interatrial septum, significant TR, high right atrial pressures, both clinically and by echo, where we had to get this patient to transplant. It was just an unworkable situation for an LVAD and prolonged ionotrope several months out. And we're seeing this, pheno this phenotype more and more. So echo is helpful for us to under understand that. Now, of all the valve challenges post-implant, so the number one we see is mitral regurgitation in the setting of a dilated cardiomyopathy, a due danular dilatation. We do see some ischemics that have a smaller heart with tethering of, of the valve. Most mitral regurg washes away with LV unloading. However, patients with pre-existing mild or moderate aortic regurgitation when they are coming off pump and, turn, and activate the LVAD, you're gonna load the left ventricle and you're gonna improve flow and improve mean blood pressure. So it's the right scenario for continuous flow through that valve and, and aortic regurg um, in, a, in a patient deemed to be uh, uh, destination therapy if associated with uh, clinical heart failure can be a real challenge for us. So on the front end, anybody with more than mild to moderate AI we have them close the aortic valve. It's a commitment to short-term bridge. We're cognizant that of the potential implication in terms of long-term uh, morbidity and, and compromised survival even. Um, but when quantifying AI, use your standards, right, put forth by uh, uh, the recent AC guideline document. But it's important to know the company it keeps. And so it could be challenging in terms of these eccentric drets. I particularly like the jet height to LV outflow track height. Um, but when you have a, a, a eccentric drets, we like to lower the pump speed and see how big the LV is. Because when it's real, the LV is not, um, the LV size is not coming down as what would typically be expected in someone with uh, moderate or more AI. Um, invasive hemodynamics, certainly are, the, the group here has been, um, been at the forefront of understanding hemodynamics and heart failure patients in general using ECHO. We too uh, looked at it in, in patients with uh, an LVAD, and it's the standard uh, uh, Doppler and spectral Doppler um, estimates. I can tell you what is different when you look at the algorithm. The mitral EA ratio is, is, at, the, is at the top, um, followed by other surrogates of high filling. And so a more than moderate left atrial size, coupled with an EA ratio, for, for example, greater than two, um, is concerning for, for partial LV unloading. And so we, we've derived and validated uh, uh, these, this algorithm, if you will, and, and bait here are the scatter plots to give you some of the raw data in terms of the strong associations. But we're using this clinically. We used to take everybody to the cath lab that came in with shortness of breath, clinical heart failure on an LVAD. The goal is to minimize the clinical heart failure syndrome. And so if we see partial LV unloading, the one thing that's not here, which I think is important, is comparing the pre-LV end diastolic dimension to the LV size at the time, of evalu at the time you're seeing the patient in clinic or in the emergency room. And so, so if you have a persistent big LV and have these, these Doppler uh, indices suggestive of LV unloading, what we'll do is we'll augment the pump speed, do a better job of controlling blood pressure in addition to, to diuretics. So that, it, that is helpful. I'm gonna transition into this concept of altering the pump speed using echo to tailor the, the setting. Now, one of the things that was an epic challenge, I think we lost our templates. We used to be able to order use this forum to <laughs> reintroduce that, but, but we used to be able to order one of these four types of tests, and then the tech was able to put that on the report, and then those reading the echo would be able to, were positioned to give us the answer we want based upon the type of test we ordered based upon the clinical reason, right? It all makes sense if we close those loops. 
Um, so I'm going to work with Dr. Naga and others to ensure that this is put back. All right? Correct me if I'm wrong. You guys don't see this in the current EPIC workflow. So an opportunity, an opportunity to, to, to do a better job. Um, now, what, what I would request is when we're in the, in the texts are, are there and we have a perfusionist or an LBAT coordinator, that you annotate, annotate the baseline pump speed. And every time we change the pump speed, we annotate it in, on the echo images so that we can understand um, um, the changes. So that when we're reviewing it on the back end, we can tailor the pump speed. And we're really looking at one of three things. We're looking at LV size, MR severity, and aortic valve functioning status. And, and we do have uh, predefined protocols, whether it's the HeartMate 2 or the HVAT or the HeartMate 3, in, term, in terms of the sweep speeds. We used to go very broad, and I, we actually learned that from Bud Frazier back in the Jarvik days, where we'd look at like 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000. The truth is when we're tailoring the pump speed, it's typically in increments of four to 800 revolutions per minute. So we revised our optimization uh, acquisition with more subtle sweep speeds. So for example, if you're at a pump speed of 9,400, we'll come down in increments of 400 or above, and we won't go, go below a certain pump speed because we know we're not gonna use that clinically. So we wanna make it easier, um, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of changing the pump speed. Now, in terms of acquisition, it's the same thing. You're getting um, images at four different pump speeds. So this is just an example of someone at a lower uh, pump speed with this is the same case of inflow cannula malposition, significant persistent mitral regurgitation. Um, and it really, even, even is that if it's at the expense of persistent aortic valve closure in some AI, MR is significantly reduced by, by increasing the pump speed. And so this translated for this particular patient less shortness of breath. This patient had a perfectly positioned inflow cannula, significant MR, so we always try to control afterload, treat with blood pressure, treat medically with diuretics. But it was really with pump speed augmentation, having to run in much higher than what is typical. For the heart mate two, typical is 9,400, 9,600 revolutions per minute. And so echo can help us tailor that pump speed based upon the substrate we think causing or contributing to the persistent breathlessness. And in this particular case, it was partial alveolar loading manifesting, manifested by persistent significant mitral regurgitation. And I mentioned that, that typically uh, goes away with most. So the features that we're looking at is a, the LV size, MR severity, aortic valve opening status, and then the conventional uh, uh, Doppler, spectral Doppler indices that um, can give us a good hint on, on LV filling pressures. Yep. yep. Very, very good question. We've, yeah, so what we've transitioned to doing speed optimization along with hemodynamics in the cath lab to best understand unloading and over unloading using echo. Um, and we're setting the speed in real time. Um, for those patients, and it's our protocols to do it in and around four weeks post implant. And so we're making that decision in real time. Now, for, for speed optimization outside of that one per protocol visit, we're doing it on the back end. And so really what we have been doing, if the report, and I'm gonna show you the expectation from the reports that we'd like to see and how it, how it would be read to help us, we're looking at the raw data. So we pull up the echo report, look at the different pump speeds. Uh, we know the clinical scenario. Now if they're asymptomatic, um, we typically order just a surveillance echo. If we're ordering a pump speed optimization, it's because we think we can fine tune the pump speed to something that's better. And we don't want to go overboard as exemplified by here. In this particular patient, even at 10,000 um, or even at 9,200, you see how the LV is very, very small. This patient's at risk for true suction events. And so to answer your question, Dr. Q, at four weeks, we're making it in real time. And that, that's the pump speed we hope is the definitive pump speed guiding that patient. But things change as patients go home in terms of blood pressure, diet. And, and for, I would say, one out of four, we're having to do repeat pump speed optimization in the ambulatory setting where we're looking at the echo uh, raw data to help guide us. But this is all on the back end. So from a logistical point of view, can we also discuss the coordination between pump technicians? Correct. Mm 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that, that has a differential that's clinically meaningful. And it includes the following. Um, uncontrolled hypertension after load for the pump, and your augmenting pump speed, you just contribute to hypertension. And so we may not see anything. The other more concerning differential is rotor thrombus and pump malfunction. And so I'm gonna show you our rule out pump malfunction protocol. But if you don't see, and we typically see We've quantitated it in an absolute way. So let's say I give you 100 patients and we went from low speed to high speed. We typically see 0.6 centimeter reduction in LV size as a, as a cohort. Translates into about 20% reduction in LV size from high to low. In those with the pump not working, specifically due to rotor thrombus, it's blunted. We don't see LV size. We don't see aortic valve changes. Uh, and, and that's concerning. So, so the pump, if it's working right, in the setting of a normal tensive patient, you should see echo changes and you should see the following. LV size that's reduced. The aortic valve opening time should be at least reduced. At least the status should be from open every time to intermittent to close. It should be, it, it, you, should, you should be uh, unloading um, to where the ability of the heart to eject above that particular higher pump speed becomes, becomes less. So, so that would be, if we saw, if, if, if you see nothing, we're concerned but we always jump to the blood to understanding blood pressure assessment. Then we screen for rotor thrombus with LDH and, 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 and other lab findings. So when you see someone presyncopal, dizzy, um, and, and you're concerned about over unloading, and this can manifest with the same pump speed, but you just over diuresed, or a bleeding diathesis, GI bleeding, right? And they come in, this can be associated with ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, and so you really want to understand this. this is different from a typical heart failure patient. Yes, you want to screen for electrolytes and those type of things, but you really want to decrease the pump speed and, and abort this cycle. Now, let's jump into our pump malfunction protocol. And for time's sake, I'm going to uh, skip some of the sentimental work done, at, done at the, with the Columbia group. But what they demonstrated is what I've mentioned, that and we've been using it for years as well. When you increase the pump speed, you should be see changes in size of LV and aortic valve function, in addition to some console things. So when we looked at our cohort and looked at the full breadth of, of, of echo parameters, the changes you should see, and they're listed there in, in yellow, LV size, aortic valve opening, you should see augmented right side of cardiac output, and your mitral valve deacceleration times with greater unloading should also become uh, more prolonged. So here's an example of nothing changing visually by 2D, and, and uh, uh, not, not, forgive me, not nothing changing, of um, appropriate change. So what you can appreciate, and I think the most specific, is the aortic valve. So this patient had actually had some myocardial recovery, ended up having their LVI taken out. But at high pump speed, look at that aortic valve. That's closed. So you should see that in a normal functioning uh, heart. That's in contrast to this particular patient, um, where Dr. Q, just like you mentioned, eight, nine, 10, 11, nothing's changing. You can quantify it, you can look at it, but for me, what I would hang my hat on is that valve is opening to the same degree despite a high pump speed. So we've modified it, and, and, and I say this so the techs know that we're trying to minimize their work. You go to Columbia, you're doing 12 speed settings. We just want low and high, and we compare the two to understand if the pump's working or not. So this is another example post-op day for some ingestion, I think of probably clot and subsequent rotor thrombus and outflow cannula uh, obstruction to where even if the images aren't the best, you can appreciate LV size, aortic valve opening, nothing's changing. We crank that pump up to 12,000. So some, something's wrong with, 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 with the pump. And we go through our algorithm. And so the hope is to have a report that captures that based on size and aortic valve function Mitral valve uh, deacceleration would be helpful, but if you just capture LV size and aortic valve status, that'd be key. Um, and so, so this is our derived scoring system based upon these measurements. And if you just describe in the report, that's helpful. And we use it clinically. I'm not going to go through this algorithm. If we see pump malfunction from hemolysis, we pursue exchange. Dr. Ash created this TPA lysis protocol, which we're experimenting with, which is working, uh, which we may give. <laughs> You guys laugh as you know Dr. Ash. And then, and then recovery comes up, it's still a low frequency phenomenon. 
one to two percent nationally, but there is a cohort of patients that are younger, non-ischemic, short duration of heart failure where this is as high as 30 percent. And it's three simple questions on their baseline pump speed. Is their size normalized? Is there a aortic valve at least opening at that baseline pump speed? And do they have normal hemodynamics? Because if we see that at baseline imaging, before taking them to the cath lab and exercising them, we'll just lower their pump speed to see if their heart dilates and if their function changes. Because if we see that they failed, we no longer proceed to echo recovery protocol. So, for example, this patient at the lowest pump speed with a heart mate two, with the valve not opening, function still poor, you want to ensure blood pressure is stable, we're done. We don't need to go do anything. This, patient, this heart hasn't recovered, right, in, 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 a, in a robust way. And so this is supported by, the, by um, what I had the opportunity to co-chair with Rain Steinbeck in a, in a good document which has everything related to ECHO and NAVADS. I think it's very, probably too long. Uh, but as a source document, you, can, you guys can look at. And so there are clear working definitions for associated LVAD complications. If someone comes in with TI or stroke, ECHO still first line to understand clot, aortic root, LV uh, in and around the inflow canyon and LV. CT is robust. So I'm going to end with three things because I want to, uh, Dr. Suman to have enough time. So surveillance echo report expectations. And what I want to do is I want to, much like I guess the TAVR guys do a good job of hanging up their, their templates and, and adherence to the template reading. So uh, my, my goal, and I say it every year, and I think this year I have to do it, um, is to put these in the echo lab in terms of here's the surveillance echo report, here's the pump, rule pump malfunction report, here's the pump speed optimization report, here's a myocardial recovery report. And so really what, what we're looking for is, is apical inflow, systolic and diastolic, aortic valve opening status, interventricular interatrial septal position, in addition to the standards, right, of, of the read. And, and, and so that would be just a surveillance study. And for optimization, we're looking at the different pump speeds, comments on LV size, MR severity, and opening status. And then we can understand, like exemplified in this particular report, in addition to the surveillance test, you know, at a particular, like for example, at, at, at 10,000, the LV size is 6.7 versus 7.2, but aortic valve is persistently closed from moderate to severe, maybe to more moderate MR. But it was only at higher pump speed you saw less MR. And it, well, it, so is that patient where you do it? Yeah, so, so this was our older protocol when we were doing broader sweep speeds. So now we're doing increments of 4 to 800 to fine tune where to leave it, but I would go just under 11. So it would be 10, 600? Because I know I'm not where I need to be between eight, nine, and 10. And so it does help us. Even though they're crude sweep assessments, it, it gives us some objective data uh, to, to rely. So the pump malfunction protocol, so they're gonna do baseline, and, and we've modified this, they're gonna do low and high. And so let me give you the modified report. So really I'm interested in is the LV size, what's the LV size reduction, low versus high? What's the aortic valve opening? You can just qu qualify it. We may go back and measure it, and, and, and the mitral valve here. And this gives us a good hint if, 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 the if the pump's working or not. So that would be a nice pump malfunction report. So echo's critical, echo's first line. This concept of variable pump speed changes for optimization, minimize heart failure to understand if the pump's working, and ramping down to understand myocardial recovery helps us. Patient. So I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the techs and all their hard work and the time they take to do this. And this is the year I'm going to do a better job of monitoring. So do the TAVR people send out emails when the report doesn't come back? Maybe uh, exactly how it's aligned? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on the fellows. Because if you guys are pre-reading, you have to pre-read in the line to the expectation. Right? Because you go to other sophisticated centers, and I would qualify us as a sophisticated center, we should have a standardized acquisition and a standardized report based upon the so inquiry. ECHO is obviously the first line of diagnostic tool, but uh, once you have the suspicion that what's wrong, you know, uh, I think oftentimes there's enough information. And before the end of C CT, I mean, uh, I mean, they make clinical decision all the time based on ECHO and clinical finding. But I think with the um, coming of the uh, new technology in the CT will allow us to, to have uh, very accurate depiction of the LVAD structure before you take the patient back to the OR to do any changes. I think if the patient's condition allow renal function, hemodynamic, uh, doing a CT, I believe is uh, clinically useful. 
So obvious limitation of the echo is you cannot see most of the parts of the L band. Okay. And this is the images that we generated years back in one of the uh, Jerry's um, uh, review article in Jack Imaging almost six, seven years ago. Okay, I think I believe the other the other the one on the right hand side, this image is is, is basically taken out uh, from uh, older scanners, and it, it, it looks good. It looks good, but uh, but now we can with a newer CT we can do 4D CT. I'm not sh so sure what the what the clinical utility, but it certainly looks nice. <laughs> huh? Right? Okay. So this overview is we're going to go through the different components of the CT, which the main strength is anatomical evaluation. Okay. So HARM-A2, uh, this one that we're going to encounter the most. Uh, Jerry went through the different part with you guys. So this will be a, a reasonable uh, info camera positions. When you read the CT, uh, the info camera tip pointed toward the mitral uh, annulus. Um, so this is, will be a good position. And then you have position like this. Uh, I'm sorry. This is, will be a normal alpha graph or cannula position. Um, straight line all the way up to the ascending iota uh, without kinking or, or narrowing. And you can look at the integrity of the, uh, the, the casing of the, uh, the graph as well. Uh, with the newer uh, device, like hardware, it's a little bit different. You can tell that. Uh, the pump is inserted directly into the apex, and uh, and the consequence of that is the alpha camera now has to uh, go a little bit, a little bit curve, or curve, have to curve around the, the left ventricle and the right ventricle to get to the ascending aorta. Okay, and this is what it looks like, it's very different, and that presents a challenge to our CT evaluation because as uh, you can see there, it can generate a lot of metal artifacts. Uh, so that's, it's a challenge. We don't have that much experience with this newer type of uh, device, but uh, we will learn, I'm sure, and uh, uh, there's some algorithm we can use to de decrease the artifact. And uh, again, this is, uh, you can see the very different um, uh, trajectory of the alpha cannula with this newer device uh, being ha having the pump directly inserted into the apex. Uh, but then you get, get away with uh, all this problem with the info cannula. Uh, okay, so this is a 3D depiction uh, of the, uh, the hardware device. So I think I predict that with this type of uh, uh, device with a different uh, trajectory of alpha cannula, we might be seeing li different sets of problems down the line. But this, so harm 3 uh, as Jerry mentioned, is very kind of similar to the hardware 2, uh, hardware. Uh, is that correct, Jerry? In terms of design and location. Okay. So for anatomical standpoint is, you know, I think it's very similar. It will present the similar sets of challenges. Um, so one thing that we saw, one, one thing you need to look at is, you know, this is different integrity of different components. This is one of the patients who had the bend relief disconnection. I think uh, obviously patient is still alive. So, you know, it's, they're still uh, casing outside the whole thing together, but uh, chest x-ray can show you as well, but uh, obviously with CT you can uh, look at more uh, with more detail. So this is one thing that you can look at, and this is one of the cases that Jerry uh, showed earlier. The inflow, this is a harm A2, the inflow camera position is clearly and grossly malpositioned. Basically the whole camera is stuck into the apical septum and there's no uh, no surprise the patients, you know, have myocardial irritation with VTAC and, and suction event. Every time they crank it up, you know, the, uh, the myocardium get into the, the, the tip of the cannula. So this is, this is an extreme case. Um, again, this is a different, different case of the patient with different type of uh, uh, LVAD. Uh, this, this one is stuck into the apical anterior wall. And this is a very interesting case because every time the patient take a deep breath, whatever position, I think the changes in the, in the intrathoracic pressure and the movement of the lungs actually push the, the LV into the myocardium and you have VTAC. 
It's very, I think you end up having exchange. And this is a case that Jerry already mentioned, patient with uh, worsening MR after the LVAD was put into uh, the posterior wall, and you can see clearly affecting the mitral subvalvular apparatus of the mitral valve. Okay. So uh, Jerry mentioned this already. We try to come up with, uh, uh, I believe, well, all the diagnostic uh, uh, methodology, CT should be the gold standard in determining the position of implo cannula for harm me too. Uh, you can see this spectrum of different uh, angles, orientation uh, with respect to the mitral inflow. But again, you know, to, to propose a classification like this, you really need to have clinical data to back up. But again, this problem might disappear with uh, Harm, Har Harmay 3 and Harwell device because they don't no longer ha have that info cannula position problem. So it's very, I wouldn't say common, but it's not unusual to see the alpha cannula kinking, okay? Again, that's why echo is very important. This is just anatomical. It's the same thing with coronary stenosis. You see a stenosis doesn't mean it's flow limiting. So in order for you to say this kinking is significant, you need to have documentation that with the Doppler, uh, increased Doppler velocity, okay, or any clinical finding. And obviously this, is, uh, this case is the, probably the worst case we've seen out of uh, uh, close to 100 cases we did is the double severe hairpin kinking and, and actually the patient has, uh, didn't do too well. Unfortunately, I think he didn't make it it was too, too sick to go through the exchange, I believe. And this is, again, the patient with air in the, in the system. Uh, and um, this is a other co rare complication we've seen. is a recurrent bleeding from the dry line sign. The alpha cannula anastomosis site has a little pseudo aneurysm, as you can see there. And when, this is a 3D depiction. Um, Again, we've seen this only one case. And the, the vascular surgeon went in there and put a bunch of occluder device. I don't know, Jerry, did it work? No, Not really. Um, oh, well. But after they put it in, you can, you can, there's no way to assess that uh, sort of aneurysm anymore. OK. Uh, again, Dr. Easter mentioned that most of the Clot occurs in the rotor, okay? But occasionally, this again is really not common at all to have thrombosis form inside the cannula. So this is the case of the patient who had uh, outflow graft, complete thrombosis, okay? You can see there's no contrast. And the image quality is so bad because, you know, a patient obviously is in really bad shape, low flow state, so the contrast has a hard time getting into the, uh, the left ventricle and obviously can't get out, okay? So this is an example. Again, this is just an echo finding. And this is a case of patient who have both com complete thrombosis of the outflow graft and also partial thrombosis of the inflow cannula. OK? And this is what it looked like after the exchange. Um, one of the important we're seeing, we're paying more attention is uh, L2 root thrombosis. I mean, it's not strictly a problem with the LVAD, but because the, uh, the problem with the aortic valve opening, uh, it creates certain milieu in which um, promotes thrombosis. And if you look at the literature, it's always reported that most commonly occurs in the non coronary sinus, supposedly because there's no coronary artery, so there's less flow in that sinus, and that's mostly based on some uh, so short series of surgical finding and some of them by echo. And we found out, with our experience, that's not the case. I mean, it's not common. Uh, I think we've seen about five or six cases out of uh, 90 from, with HARMA 2. What's interesting, we saw, I think, one or two with HARMA 3, you know, this relatively fewer number of patients that we, we've done. So. Um, and the patient obviously can present any thromboembolic phenomena. Again, this is a patient who present, I believe he presented with a TIA stroke, had thrombus in the left sinus of Alsalva with one year later uh, with intensive anticoagulation, the clot has, has become smaller. This is a patient, a woman with hemolysis, uh, with 
with a uh, power spike, and I think suspicion of GI bleeding or mesenteric ischemia, I believe, after was found to have clot in the lab and non coronary sinus. And uh, six months later, those clot has disappeared, uh, whether they embolize or not. And this is probably one of the very traumatic cases, a patient with, after LVAD, implantation, a chest pain, and troponin, and EKG changes, evidence of uh, myocardial infarction. As you can see, ex extensive, extensive thrombus occupying left sinus, non coronary sinus, and part of the right coronary sinus. And you can see in the right lower corner, in the delay imaging, uh, the feeling defect persists, documenting that this is truly a, a, a aortic root thrombus. Yeah, so. I, I agree. If the patient is stable enough, I think I will avoid you the trouble. Imagine you try to cannulate the coronary. I mean, you probably stroke you, the patient will probably stroke out in front of you, right? Again, uh, so not only, not only the, uh, the complications um, pertinent to LVAC, uh, CT is very useful in those difficult echo window that we suspect surgical complication. Uh, this is massive pericardial tamponade in a patient who have VIVAD. I mean, this is probably, I mean, echo obviously saw, you know, you, you were able to see this uh, effusion, but to the extent of it, you know, CT gives you an uh, idea how, how dramatic this, and you, to the point that you see the LV is basically a sliver of cavity because there's no no, pre no, no, the preload is so compromised. And this 3D construction, not only that, you can see that it was kinking of the bivad outflow cannula as well to make the things even worse. So you have both tamponade and kinking of the outflow cannula, and no wonder the patient didn't, wasn't doing too well. Infections, uh, I have to say, this is not from our center. I think, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, it's, it's rare, but Basically, you look for pocket of air around the device in the pump, okay? And obviously, I think right now, we pretty much accepted that CT uh, allows you to look at the native heart and the, and the, the pump, and it's variable uh, when other modality, meaning echo, is not revealing. And the challenges I already mentioned, the marital artifact, there's some, there's some reduction algorithm, and now there's some, uh, Possibility we can see inside the pump, but uh, uh, we would need to do more research in terms of if this type of uh, post-processing algorithm is robust enough to allow you to see through the metal casing of the pump and to see to, to make the diagnosis of uh, the presence of clot. And you probably won't be able to see the micro thrombus. I, I would be interested. And what I want to ask Jerry about, when they exchange the pump, when they say there's a pump thrombosis, yeah. what, what how, I mean, how do they make the diagnosis? I mean, is that a small clot? They change the pump and they look down the barrel and look at the uh -huh. look at the clot. So they look down and look at the, the, the clot. But not any harm, you have to change from the pump to the instrument. And they do an analysis to look for Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, now that's helpful. So at least we have a decent gold standard. Okay, this is artificial heart. Um, I'm not going to go through it. We total artificial heart is very. Rare. Well, I don't think we put that many here. The last thing I want to mention is uh, uh, occasionally, you know, you have patient with difficult window. Uh, it's hard to evaluate LV function. Uh, you want a more objective assessment of the fraction for a patient who you suspect a recovery. 
or you want to get a better sense of RB function assessment, which is oftentimes not so easy with echo. And uh, believe it or not, uh, MAGA is, could be useful. Uh, you know, you can do a patient with renal insufficiency as long as the patient can lay flat for a little while and they have decent window uh, and you have a tech who know how to do it. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like the, this disappearing art. I mean, we do it so few right now that a lot of people don't know really how to do it. Um, so, but, but MAGA could be useful. This is a case I think they suspected EF in the 40% before and after the pump speed changes. And obviously you can always have, CT can give you um, very good images. This is the patient before. This is after the LBAD, I think for RV assessment. As you can see the you know, RV, what's interesting is if you look at carefully, in the, I wanna sh I show this to Dr. Ash. I'm not sure I show it to Jerry. You can see the, you know, let me see if I can get my arrow out here. Okay, I'm not successful. If you pay attention to the anterior wall of the, of the RV, I mean, it's almost uh, at here. All right. So I wonder if it could have some constriction mechanism to this. You can see that anterior wall is basically stuck to the sternum and it doesn't, doesn't move at all. I don't know if you appreciate that. I don't want to have a marker. Or... Yeah, I don't know if you get appreciated in the monitor that. I, you know, probably better if I show in the monitor. You can see this wall here and this wall here. I mean, there's some thickening, but basically almost uh, looks like the, the, it's stuck to the. And if you want to come over here, look at the, the, mon the, the screen. Um, so this is the other, you know, potential utilization of the uh, CT. Uh, in the old day with the old scanner, the amount of radiation will be, I wouldn't say prohibitive, but you wouldn't be able to do this often. With our new scanner, uh, we have the part, you know, we can do lower KV imaging, and now we we'll try to some different protocol to reduce the amount of contrast we use. So make this a potential, um, uh, uh, alternative for echo or even TE in patient that uh, you really had a hard time assessing the, the RV function. So, and then I think this is a general talk how do we measure EF by the CT. We can do either Simpson method, uh, same thing with MRI and echo, or what we call threshold based, completely automated. Uh, basically, it tracks the, the, the contrast. Uh, difference between the cavity and the myocardium, and you get the EF from the uh, LV and RV. In this case, number, in a well, well done study, I mean, numbers should be quite similar. <laughs>